Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Joining me, my good friend, Peter Grandich, petergrandich.com, at Peter Grandich on Twitter. And you can hear him often on Relevant Radio uh, and the Drew Mariani Show. And you can see him here uh, on the Ed Morrissey Show. Uh, Peter, welcome back. Always great to be talking with you. Good to be with you, Ed, again. So many things to talk about. And I, we, we were just discussing this right before I started hitting the record button here, but I, the first thing we got to talk about is the White House and the the Secret Service investigation <laughs> into the cocaine baggie. Um, you suggested a new theme song for this White House, and I, I have to heartily endorse that. But I'm going to let you just I'm going to let you reveal it. Oh, I think it's it'd be perfect. Eric Clapton, cocaine. <laughs> either that or white line fever i don't know <laughs> you know it, it's supposed to be the most secure building you go in yeah nothing is supposed to happen there without somebody being able to see it and know it and it probably took them three to four days to figure out exactly what's the best route to how we're going to cover this up yeah i mean the idea that yeah, you know, the the baggie had no fingerprints and no DNA on it when it got to the FBI yeah. laboratory. Just tells you everything that you need to know. Somebody cleaned this up before it went over to the FBI. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, yeah. You know the change, the changing of the story. Then we find today, as we talk, they actually had two other incidents in the last couple of years, and uh, you know marijuana or what have you. It just, it, but you know, it it is such. There is no faith anymore when you look at all the different investigations and all the different accusations they all can't be wrong especially when whistleblowers show up who basically terminate their career when you become a whistleblower right. that's why you have to offer such a financial reward to it because even if you go back to your job you're always looking over your shoulder for the rest of your time at wherever that may be and all and despite all that and all there's still a certain segment of the media that's going, I see nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> we should stop calling a mainstream media and call them Sergeant Schultz media. Well, that's what it is. It really, it, 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 it you know, there, there comes a time when you, you just have to be human enough to say, listen, you know, it, it's so overwhelming, circumstantial, whenever. I mean, you, you don't have to go past the fact no one forms 14 LLCs if they don't have to. Yeah, that's a really good point. I was going to bring actually bring up something else, right? I was going to bring up the the, the fact that Christopher Ray has spent five months investigating his own office and still has nothing to say about. Uh, it still can't uh, come to any conclusions about how the FBI uh, Richmond office was going to investigate Catholics, radical yeah. traditional Catholics, um, because of their opposition to abortion. That to me was a, a red letter incident i mean the fbi is the premier investigative agency in the world or at least they they like to think of themselves as that and here they are <laughs> investigating their own office and five months later they still don't have any answers i mean that's <laughs> that's his only actual answers were to things that were already out there yeah. he, he gave even things that were in the records but haven't been widely publicized he couldn't remember, can't recall, doesn't know this, doesn't know that. When people are saying, well, why isn't something being done? Well, why isn't something being done? All the people responsibly for being doing something to get done is on one side. That that's the uh that's the amazing thing. That, you know, the whole side of justice is gone haywire. There's there's right. no and, and, you know, people were saying in the early, in the first 24 hours, well, this is the Secret Service. They're not going to, you know, they are the premier. They, they're not going to play around. You know, they, they take bullets for guys and so forth. Which they do. I mean, that's true. It's a different, different, it's a different part of the Secret Service. Right. But, you know, I, I, I salute their courage and in, in what they do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, everything just seems to be organized into covering stuff up for the current occupants of the white house and that gets us to the uh, you say 14 llc's i i think i recall it, it was more like 20 or more llc's formed by the bidens to funnel money that was coming in from places like cefc which was a uh which was a front for chinese intelligence uh this was 
April, I think that um, the oversight committee had this um, had all this information in there. And I mean, you're a money guy. I mean, there's LLCs exist for a reason. There's it, just because something's an LLC doesn't make it suspicious, but you don't need 20 of them no. to deal with this. No. I mean, as, as a money guy, you're looking at that. What does that tell you? Well, when, when one says transferring one to the other, payments going to different family members, I still never got over the one when it came out that Hunter paid $50,000 a month to stay in the house. My lovely son. I mean, that was like, you know, it, it, listen, this is the law enforcement that I still know. I had good FBI friends. They were all gone out of it. But sure. the ones that I could still talk to and all said this is well beyond circumstantial evidence. If there was a legitimate force, there would be there would be a special prosecutor, there'd be a special investigation, uh, and 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 that'd be that. And it's it, it, it's really concerning when you think about it. Uh, when you look at this poor man, I mean, he's been he, he's clearly a, addicted to drugs. He, it's been multiple. Uh, right. People suddenly want to pay him five hundred thousand for paintings. Okay, I mean, when you think of the whole story of this and monies that came in and recordings, and think about this: if he wasn't the idiot who put the freaking computer in the place. Most of this stuff would have never probably even been known, right? You right. Know? And, and and then whoever handles their imaging, the first thing I would have said to him: this thing you're doing with ignoring this grandchild is just like even your Democrats are not going to support that. And right. they did lose some face, some fairly good face over that, and it helped turn at least the press corps. At least now the press corps is willing to stand up and ask these questions, even though he refuses to answer, you know, or, or gets angry if, if he answers at all. But it is just, and, and, and here's the worst part of it all. Even if you got them and you proved by the round of doubt that they did it, something worse is behind that. It's called President Harris. No, seriously. I, right, I, I, right. Yes. I, 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 I don't say that to be funny. I mean, if you want to see things go in the can real fast, have her suddenly become the president of the United States. Right. No, I agree with you. And, and yeah, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of impeachment insurance. I think, it, you know, uh, Kamala Harris is, you know, you're, you're talking about um, the same issues that we're all talking about, of course. And um, the idea that we're, that these institutions have just become politically corrupted. I, I, I do agree with you. And, and that includes the mainstream media. And I, I think you're right. I think that there, there is a point at which they do balk and the, and the grandchild is the point. I thought it was very interesting that Maureen Dowd of all people in the New York times of all places wrote, you have seven grandchildren, Mr. President, and um, it's horrible what you're doing. And it, um, it, undermines your entire uh, claim to compassion, which is true. Uh, look, I mean, you can be embarrassed about the the situation uh, by which, you know, this this child is is around. But I mean, this is Hunter's child. It makes it makes this this little girl his grandchild. And to completely refuse to acknowledge her, even just to say, yes, she's my grandchild is strange it's weird and it adds to a level of weirdness that we've seen from joe biden really for decades that the media just simply doesn't like to talk about but this guy's been weird for decades in very in, in really in, in ways that have to do with um his behavior around girls and women i mean that's been going on for years too this guy is odd it's all over as we speak today him going up to a child there in finland and acting very unbecoming as a man should be sniffing her. And, oh, I mean, it's just. Yeah, that was it, strange. <laughs> but, but there's so many of them. You know what I mean? It's not one yeah. or two. And it's just and it's just an amazement. And then people say to me, well, there doesn't seem to be any concern about America lo losing its proudness in the world and all. And as you know, I did believe there's some geopolitical events unfolding that are real, real big, bigger than perhaps in decades. And here you have clearly 
They may not say it publicly yet in front of the media, but I would say world leaders on the West as well as the other side are looking at this and going, oh my God, this, this, there's no real leadership there. This, this is someone is pulling the strings behind the curtain. I mean, he has yeah. to look at notes while, while he's speaking to world leaders to remember what he's supposed to say. How would you feel to be negotiating with somebody that way? You certainly wouldn't believe that they were the person in charge or had the capabilities of making the decisions that need to be made. Well, you know, I think you're right about that. Uh, it, it, I mean, the notes are the worst are, are are not the worst part of this, right? The it's the getting lost in the middle of speeches part that is the most concerning part of that. And at least if he's working off of notes, you got a pretty good idea of what the U.S. government as a whole is saying to you in those in, in those uh, forums. But yeah, I mean, there is nothing about this president that gives anybody any confidence that he's actually the guy running things, and that the people who are running things actually know what they're doing. Hey, uh, Ed. Who is running it? That's the real. You know, well, well, I, I I've heard theories, right? Barack Obama is running it through, um, um, oh, what's her name, Valerie Jarrett. Um, you know, Jill Biden is running it. Um, I, I guess I could even say Hunter Biden might be running it. <laughs> but I think it would. I think it'd be a lot worse if Hunter Biden was running it. Not that not that it could get a lot worse than what it is right now, but um, but I'm pretty sure that I know that Joe Biden isn't running it. No. And uh, think about it. We still got a couple of years left, you know, regardless of whether he runs in 24 or whatever and all. And it just is accelerating to the downside now. Yeah. The, the poop paws, the inabilities, the physical out of it all. I don't see how at all. And I talked to a, a world renowned brain surgeon, happens to be a client, and he says, I don't give him six months. I don't think he'll be able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. When you think about already that 150 days have been used for vacations, mm -hmm. some days he's been done by 10 a.m. I mean, imagine if, if he had to go three or four days in a row working 10 or 12 hours. It's just, it's not possible. And yeah. the person that would fill in for him is twice as bad. So it's, we're we're on the edge. If there's ever something beyond serious, we have a very huge problem until whatever you know takes place in the election in 2024. I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100. Can Can I tell you one thing? I'd be interested in your yeah. questions with chatting here. Sure. I I might not be the only person saying this. I've grown to respect Robert Kennedy. Okay. You know, I'm talking to a hard conservative, and I consider myself a conservative. I, I grown to respect him. I'm willing to listen to what he has to say. And I think some of the things he's brought out are very worthy to listen to. I think he's being very careful, <laughs> quite frankly, to do exactly what you're talking about. But RFK Jr. is kind of a nut. He always has been kind of a nut. He's just a nut who's gotten a couple of things very, very right. And, and in one particular sense is valuable now because it wasn't just conservatives that were getting that were having their their speech rights uh, quashed and who were getting censored and suppressed. RFK Jr. was as well. Um, but I, I mean, I think he's interesting to listen to, but I am I am not falling in love with the guy. Uh, and and the reason why is because pretty much everything prior to 2020 with RFK Jr. This guy is uh, uh, he's on the far left. Um, I will say this, is that I I consider him sort of like Dennis Kucinich, who is a, a man of the left, always has been, but has sort of like this um, sincere charm about it, <laughs> okay? I actually kind of like Dennis Kucinich when he's talking. I kind of like Dennis Kucinich because he really believes what he says. And I think RFK does as well. Even though I think what he says is sometimes just, you know, uh, as nutty as a fruitcake, he really believes it. Uh, and I remember when he ran for president. I don't remember, do you remember when Dennis Kucinich ran for president? I think it was in the 2004 yes. cycle, right? It was the same cycle that Kerry was running for president. And he had this, he modeled his campaign website based on a children's book. I think it was something grandpa, Grandfather Moonlight or something like that. And I was thinking, this is so Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> 
It really is. And it's not a put on. It's not, it's, it, it wasn't a, it, you know, he, it wasn't a fake. I mean, this is really who the guy is. So there's an authenticity to Dennis Kucinich that I, I, I find charming. Um, closer to home, when he was still around, um, the, um, oh, uh, now I'm going to forget his name. He was a senator from, uh, from Minnesota. He was senator while I was there. Uh, Paul, um, oh gosh, now I feel terrible. He died in an airplane accident in 2002 and um or two no 2002 or 2000 yeah 2002 and um i can't think of his last name now it's terrible and he's you know sort of a granola lefty right uh, and that was kind of what his thing was um but he was honest about it he was sincere about it that was who he really was you know, you know what that, you're that saying honest. there you know what you're saying there ed what i get from that yeah robert kennedy and all a legitimate far left. AOC and them are not legitimate. No, because and 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 the reason why is because they have goals and ambitions that they don't like to talk about that they keep right. hidden, and they they manipulate people. Uh, whereas you know Kucinich and oh gosh, <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue too. It begins with a W. Paul something. Um, those guys were. Um, you know, they were, they were being authentic. Um, there's another one in um, Oregon, not Merkley, but the other one, I can't think of his name now, uh, current Senator, who's, who's very similar to the guy who was calling out uh, John Brennan for lying to Congress. Um, that there's a certain authenticity about them that um, even when you disagree with them and disagree with them vehemently, you can still respect them. And I think RFK Jr. is kind of landing in that position. But make no mistake about it. This guy's a hard lefty. This guy is, uh, you know, uh, he's somebody who thinks that um, uh, others should make decisions for people. Um, he's just unhappy at the moment because others made decisions about what he could do and say, and he doesn't like it. And he's right not to like it. Um, but that's kind of my opinion about about RFK. I think he's more authentic than some, though. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, there's a certain attractiveness to what he's saying and not to mention the fact that you have that sort of the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing going on as well so well let me ask you while we're, we're speaking here so believing biden couldn't possibly do another four years after this how do the democrats move him out do they move him out because they have somebody else come out of more legitimacy, like a cat Newsom. I don't think so. I, I'm I, honest. And by the way, it was all, Senator Paul Wellstone was the name that I was trying to remember, and um, who passed away again. He he, he died in two thousand two in in a plane crash during his campaign. It was right near the end of the campaign too. They drafted Mondale in the last week of the campaign to fill in for him, uh, and Mondale lost to Norm Coleman. But. Um, but um, I just want to make sure I, I I made sure that that's correct. It's Senator Paul Wellstone. So that's that's the person I was thinking of. No, I mean, I think that what happens is, is that somebody's really going to have to just decide that it's time to push him aside, right? I mean, this is, somebody's going to have to be Eugene McCarthy, you know, from 1968 to step up and say, okay, enough is enough. I'm running against this guy. Or, you know, if you want something a little... Um, uh, more recent than that, Pat Buchanan in 92, or, you know, the 92 cycle, I should say, late in 1991, decided that he was going to run in New Hampshire. Um, now that Buchanan didn't push George H.W. Bush out of the race, but it made clear that he, he had started to run out of gas inside the Republican Party. When Eugene McCarthy came in, he's either second or a strong third in New Hampshire against, um, against LBJ. LBJ saw the writing on the wall and just decided he was, he was, going to reverse himself and not run for another term in office. Um, I think it's going to have to take something like that. And it's not going to be RFK that does it. It's going to have to be somebody who's got a little bit more mainstream draw. And I think that means, and I'm not even sure that Newsom's the guy to do that. Newsom's, uh, Newsom's sort of a oily airhead <laughs> who's not even very popular in his own home state and uh, is routinely getting thumped when he tries to tackle Texas and 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 florida but i you know you see somebody like maybe you know, roy cooper may not be the right guy for it to be the model of the guy to do it but i i'd say it'd have to be somebody um 
it'd have to be a governor outside the DC bubble because inside the DC bubble, they're going to be circling the wagons. So, you know, a, a Roy Cooper, a Jared Paulus in, in Colorado, um, that sort of thing, maybe even Pritzker out of Illinois. Um, Although he'd be a nightmare. What what you call on the Republican side right now? You know, it's too early to tell. You know, there's a lot of people who are trying to argue that, oh, Ron DeSantis is falling behind, is collapsing. First off, there's no collapse. The polls are pretty much static. He just got done raising $20 million in six weeks. And in, in the second quarter, his PAC raised, you know, $67 million on its own. He's got a, a ton of money. He's building a uh, he's building a ground organization that is simply going to be second to none in this cycle um and i think you got to wait for the debates to play out I, you know i think it's open i think trump has got a really serious advantage and and might be able to ride that all the way out um but i think that he he's not in iowa today at that um uh, at that presidential forum that tucker carlson is um hosting and so he's ducking that. He's ducking the first debate. At least so far, he's ducking the first debate too. You know, you can only duck so long <laughs> before people start getting the idea that you're afraid to get in the ring. And I, I think that that's not going to play well. So I, I would say the people who have a realistic shot at this are probably Trump, DeSantis, Tim Scott, I think has got a, uh, it could be a, um, uh, you know, a guy who's, in the wings and ready to take advantage if if people start faltering and maybe nikki haley although i don't no. uh, i'm I don't a tim know. scott I, I very much like him he's uh he seems like somebody that can bridge the gaps in a lot of areas and well he's really positive he's he's very upbeat he's great on the stump um the, the big knock on him is that he hasn't been a he hasn't been an executive you know right. he's he's inside the, he's inside the beltway and you know usually republicans don't like inside the beltway i mean you know john mccain kind of got in by default in 2008 and that didn't work out very well bob dole same thing in 96 and that didn't work out very well at all so you know i'm thinking that that's not a great path for tim scott but we'll see I, I think realistically, though, it's going to be down between uh, Trump and DeSantis. DeSantis is good. He's 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 been he's experienced. He just come, came off a 19 point win in Florida. He's not. This is not a guy who's going to collapse. It's not a guy who's going to do a Scott Walker or Tim Pawlenty. <laughs> he's got tons of money. He's building organization and he knows how to win. So, yeah, I think it's going to probably just come down to those two guys. But we'll see. So my Ed Morrissey write in should just stop right now. <laughs> yeah i mean um what's what's the old line if nominated i will not run if uh, elected yeah i'll serve <laughs> yeah let me get in there and make a few crack a few heads i'd be okay with that but uh, no i don't i i don't want that i, we I don't want I... we don't want to hear anything about crack that's keep that <laughs> out I, should I write in Peter Grandich? I mean, are you are you are you up for that? No, I don't think I'm up for it. I, I you know, getting back to maybe a couple of things before we end, I I don't think yeah. Americans appreciate yet the depth of our economic, social, and political troubles ahead, led by the economics. That you cannot continue something you and I have been talking about for years. Just the the avalanche. Mm -hmm of increasing debt, uh, the servicing of the interest now is really coming in serious minds, not the talking heads from Wall Street, but some of the good brains that are in the financial world are all coming out now going, this is preposterous. It can't last. Uh, we're past the point of no return. And then you, when you throw in the retirement crisis, which is acute now because the boomers have reached that stage, Two-fifths of boomers don't even have anything saved. Yep. It, it just doesn't bode well. And yeah, the market could rally, but when you have 40% of the level, the, the lowest 40% of wage earners in, in the United States now 
have less cash than they did before the pandemic started. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, there's the, you cannot continue to have the, the top of the pyramid doing well while the rest slips and slides or falls. It cannot continue while, look, we just had a couple of months ago about, you know, raising the debt ceiling. And as soon as that was taken care of, three quarters of a billion trillion dollars have been added to the debt. Yeah. Yeah, that was the point to be able to do that. It, it, Absolutely. It can't, yeah. I mean, we, we are kicking this can so far down the road that it's basically falling. We're, we're about ready to the next kick is going to send us falling off off the cliff. You're absolutely Ed, right about that. Ed, you're not going to be able to kick it anymore. That's the problem. Yeah. It, it's going to get to the point where they're going to go kick it and go, ouch, because it's not going to move. Yeah. And, the and, debt service alone is going to start out. If it hasn't already, it's going to start out stripping. The that, that's plan. why, in my opinion, central banks around the world, Western and Eastern, have been huge hoarders of gold because they know another system is going to have to replace it eventually, may not be this year, may not even be next year or the year after. We're seeing countries now willing to form under this brick and umbrella. I don't cannot begin to tell people how critical it was how Saudi Arabia moved from the middle, played both sides, to really the, the east side now. And, you know, is entertaining, selling its oil outside of the dollar, becoming a part of the BRIC nations, making amends with its mortal enemy, Iran, which is still a mortal enemy to the United States. Right. The geopolitical events that are happening outside the boundaries of the U.S. are so significant and so few in the professional financial community here either speak about it and or know about it or even understand it. And while it may not impact the market tomorrow, I can tell you it's going to impact the market for years to come. No, I agree with that. And by the way, BRIC is Brazil, Russia, India, and China, just for those who don't understand it. So is this sort of um, third, that eh, third world is not, is not the right, um, is not the right um, thing for this, but sort of the, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Sort of the, Non-Western, um... more like, but understand this: both China and India will be rivaling, if not China already, the U.S. as an economic power. Certainly, as a military power, it's become very close to that. Right. Uh, and when you take the Middle East out, where not only do we in a sense, excuse my language, pissed them off when we went over there to try to bully them, in a sense, when we were having our energy issues. We draw down our strategic reserve to the yeah. lowest in decades. Yeah, that's We should crazy. have been filling it up all this time. And it's just every asinine potential move has been so piss poor. People can say what they want about Trump. I'm not a huge Trump fan. I don't, his personality is very hard for me to swallow at all. But from an economic standpoint, he was doing some things that were very important. He made us energy independent. Right. People are realizing how important that can be. He said those things about why U.S. funding NATO against a country that you're afraid to could hurt you if invade you, but you're making all sorts of deals and depending on them for your energy and so forth and so on. He made a, he made some sense about, hey, we got to focus more on America. Today, we have, as you just said, Tucker Carlson is really ripping some of those guys who seem to be the Ukrainian supporters going, hey, we need to be focusing on the U.S. Look around. Look what look at look at the lawlessness. Look at the economic issues, the social issues. And we just keep writing checks and everything we got to a war, which some say is going a lot different than the media is telling us. No one knows for certain. You, you know, you know that. Right. There's, there's two sides to what is happening. But the way I saw that president of Ukraine at this big meeting, he didn't look like a guy that was winning something big, nor was he too happy. No, but I will say this. The side that has the rebellion is usually the side that's losing. <laughs> and, and thus far, only one side's had a rebellion, and that's and that's Russia. Look, I mean, I, I have 
I, I have a slightly different perspective on on the war in Ukraine. I think that you cannot allow countries to start wars of imperial acquisition or else you're going to start incentivizing more of that stuff. And so I think that the path that we're taking on this is the rational path. You don't add Ukraine to NATO because it, that's that's a that's just not a that doesn't make any sense at all, especially when the nation's already at war. I mean, it just doesn't. Uh, it's also not a good. It's also not a good candidate for NATO because it's it's got very deep divisions in there that have to do with whether or not this is an e an eastern facing country or a western facing country. That's the reason why they have this problem. They've had that problem for thirty years. So no, it's not a good. It's not a good candidate for NATO. But I do think though that uh, if you want to keep some semblance of a non imperial world order in place, you have to. You have to make sure that imperial wars of acquisition don't succeed. But Ed, um, Ed but Eddie, I love you, but it <laughs> comes a point where you have to think of home first. First of all, we always end up paying the lion's share of it. Right. Oh, but I agree with you on that. It's continuing now. And we deplete it, forgetting the moral things that are happening with our military. Uh, that is a story in itself. But we it deplete is. it to where... Four and five star generals, current and retire, are basically saying, if something breaks out now, we're in serious trouble. We couldn't begin to defend Taiwan or any of that nature all on on where we are as a military and all. And, you know, I'm I'm more in that camp of, hey, you know, let somebody else do it. You know, why why does the US when when we can't even when we can't even take care of a veteran veteran who went and gave up his body and many of them their lives. And they have to live in such a dire situation coming home from a war that many of us didn't even want to see. And yet we're sending pension money over so the Ukrainian people can pay and keep a fight going. I have to tell you, Eddie, that bothers me a lot. That, that no, I, I agree with you. But, but I think the bigger issue here is that we stopped being a manufacturing power decades ago. And we simply don't have the economic infrastructure <laughs> to maintain that level. It doesn't matter whether or not you're sending stuff over. I mean, it matters in the short run, whether or not you're depleting your stocks to send it to Ukraine. The problem isn't so much that you're sending the stuff to Ukraine. It's that you can't replace it. We don't have a steel industry here like we used to when we were the arsenal of democracy. We don't have the kind of workforce that we used to have um, that, um, that allowed us to have that position. When the cold, about the time the Cold War was in, well, actually a little before the Cold War was ending, we started shifting away from those economies. We started allowing those um, those industries to get overwhelmed and then to simply blink out of existence here. And um, that's, I think that's the real issue. Is and and, yeah, and we won't go after and we won't go after the raw materials necessary to do those sorts of things. Well, anymore. it takes me to maybe make this the last point on this subject. Sure. What did the pandemic show us? The pandemic showed us that we don't control our own destiny. Much of what we need comes from outside sources. That's one of the things globalization did. America was once self-sufficient. It made mostly everything we needed. Instead, we went overseas. It saved companies money. We got rid of storage, inventory, things of that nature. What has happened since we learned that in the pandemic? We have not improved our ability to be self-sustaining. We yeah. haven't. We've only indebted ourselves more. And more and more countries are basically saying, hey, you know what? You're not the greatest friend in the world, or nor do we feel that we have to be. You're the only source and the only person we should listen to. That's why I'm telling you, the brick story, which is going to take years to develop, to me, is going to rival when it's all said and done what happened in the changes from the Industrial Revolution. It's going to dramatically change how the world trades and acts with one another. And the person with the shortest stick in that is going to be the United States. That's just my prediction. Uh, I, I might not even live long enough to see whether I'm right or not, but I can tell you I'm very confident that we're moving in that direction. Well, Peter Grandich is a pretty wise guy. He's a pretty wise man. He's also a wise guy. But he's a pretty wise man as well. I, I'm from New Jersey. Don't confuse him now. Wise guy in New Jersey. Wise guy in New Jersey. Yeah, means something else. 
<laughs> that's not what I was getting at, but you're right. That means something else. He's a wise man I and agree. and you should be getting more of his wisdom and you can get more of his wisdom by going to his website, petergrandich.com, as well as going to his Twitter, um, his Twitter account at Peter Grandich, all very easy to find petergrandich.com at Peter Grandich. And, uh, and uh, over at Relevant Radio, our friends over at Relevant Radio, he's over there. He's here. Uh, Peter, always great to talk to you again. And even when we disagree, it's a heck it's of a always, lot of fun to do so. It's always a pleasure to do so. And you, you're you always a man. I'm, I'm willing to hear what he has to say, whether or not I'm on that same side, because you always present it with facts and clear reasons to justify your thoughts, even if I disagree with him, Ed. And I think the same as of you, Peter. So thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you, Ed.